Is there a risk of contaminating Earth with space-resistant bacteria when deorbiting the International Space Station? What would be the next big outpost when humanity reaches Mars? What's the real shape of Lagrange points? Plus, in our bonus part on Patreon, could there be life in lava tubes? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Carl Smith, are Lagrange points spherical or globular? Or are they a more complex shape? Before I sort of describe the shape, I think it's really important to describe what the Lagrange points are. And the sort of textbook definition is that if you have two masses with a ratio that is more than 25 to 1, then there will be five spots around those two objects where a test mass, in other words, something that is of negligible mass, effectively zero mass, can remain in or will experience a balance of forces so that they will not be sort of changing their position. Now, that's sort of like the official thing. But the reality is, is that it's a lot grosser. You know, three of the Lagrange points are lined up between the two objects. And then one of the Lagrange points is ahead of the secondary object in orbit, and the other is behind the secondary object in orbit. And those are the five Lagrange points. The three that are lined up are unstable. And so what that means is that if you have you put that test mass, that thing that is an insignificant mass in that location, then the slightest perturbation will cause it to drift out of that point and then just go into regular orbit. The ones that are ahead and behind, the L4 and the L5, those are metastable. And so if you put something into, you put your test mass into the Lagrange point, then it's going to hang out in that area and that you will get these Coriolis forces that cause this, this test mass to move around inside this area and it actually part helps keep it stable inside that place. And so what does it actually look like? You know, when you, you know, that's like your perfect, uh, platonic solid version of uh, of Lagrange points, but the reality is that the is that the solar system is very messy. You've got the sun, you've got the planets. The planets are interacting with each other. The angle of the sun's rotation is different than the angle that the Earth is going around the sun and the angle that the other planets are going around, that the Earth is on an elliptical orbit around the sun. Sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's farther. And this has an effect on everything that is attempting to orbit within these areas. And so when you go to try to get positioned at the L, L1, L2, L3 points, then you have to use propellant to be able to remain in this area. And what spacecraft will generally do is they will orbit around that point. But that point is actually changing as the Earth is going around the sun, for example. And so when you look at the animations of the of the James Webb going around the L2 point, it's in this orbit. But the reality is, is that it's having to fire its thrusters to be able to uh, maintain this, this position, try to keep getting as close as possible to orbiting around exactly the L2 point. And then the L2 point moves. And so James Webb has to fire its thrusters to get itself back into that position. With the L4 and the L5, they are stable. So if you put James Webb into the L4 or the L5, you wouldn't have to use any propellant to keep it there. That once it's inside this, this gravitational saddle, it's, it's going to remain in there. And so a good way to sort of imagine it is not that it is a point, that it is in fact a blob, a Lagrange blob. And so as long as things remain inside that area and they don't fall out of that Lagrange blob and the size of it, the shape of it depends on the mass of everything involved, depends on the perturbations, all of the other interactions, then that's what you're going to get. So it's like three hypothetical points moving around and two blobs. Old timer, mining asteroids, perhaps redirecting them to impact Mars might provide atmosphere and resources. So I guess that's two separate things. Like on the one hand, you're saying like we could mine asteroids and in the coming decades, I'm sure someone will attempt to mine an asteroid. And of course, by mining asteroids, one interesting thing that you can do is you can set up mass drivers on the surface of the asteroid, and then you can start firing out 
mass from the asteroid, maybe you're going to send it to some collector or refining facility or whatever in the solar system. And as you do so, you're giving the asteroid a kick in the opposite direction. And so that gives you the advantage. When you think about, you know, potentially threatening asteroids that are out there, you could set up mining operations on all of the scary asteroids. And you would over time, change their orbits into really whatever you want them to do. And I guess what you're proposing is why don't we just crash them into Mars? So like, will crashing asteroids into Mars help Mars? And the answer is like, it sort of depends on what you're trying to get out of it. You know, I mean, if you crash an asteroid into Mars, you're going to kick up a whole bunch of dust, it's going to create this, this shrouded dusty atmosphere, depending on the size of the asteroid, like it could be catastrophic and wouldn't recover for decades, maybe hundreds of years. And so if you don't want to touch Mars for hundreds of years, then or, you know, decades for sure, and definitely don't want to have any science facilities or anything on the surface of that planet then maybe that's going to do something, but it's not going to give you any long term success. You're going to add them to the mass of Mars slightly. But remember, it's one tenth the mass of the Earth. So you're going to have to scoop up a lot of material, you're probably going to have to crash Mars and Venus together. Um, it's not going to restart its dynamo at the, at the heart, it's just too small. And so really, all you can do is make Mars temporarily bad. And then once all the dust clears, it'll go back or the I guess you can make Mars temporarily worse. And then once the dust clears, it's going to go back to being just bad. Intrigued about becoming a patron? Don't forget that when you join our Patreon, I will send you an invitation and we will have a personal interview where I'll ask you questions about what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, how you found out about us and how we can improve. Creating content for the internet is tough. There's a lot of trolls out there. And so when I get a chance to talk to the people who are fans of our work, it lifts my spirits. So definitely join our Patreon, patreon.com slash universe today. Now, thanks to everyone who's already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Repelia, Hawkeye Tim One, Felix the Cat, Andrew Allen, Brian Blythe, and David Carter. Join the community at patreon.com slash universe today. Koi Joy Joe, what's your favorite story that you've ever broken or your first big story that you remember breaking? So my memory for big stories that we've broken is not great. But there was a story that came out a couple of years ago when um, it looked like they were going to cut the funding for New Horizons. And we got an inside tip from from people on the New Horizons team or from associated with it. And so we had sort of coverage of the story for a couple of days before anybody else sort of knew what was going on. But the exclusive coverage that we've been doing fairly recently has been making me pretty happy. So up until a couple of years ago, generally, I was very hands off in choosing the stories that we were reporting on 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 universe today. And it was very much about the writers were were finding press releases, so they were getting contacted by sources, and they were uh, reporting on various news stories. And and what I found was that it felt like we were becoming a press release rewriter. That you go and you take the press release, and then you rewrite it, and then you incorporate it into your website because that's what you're supposed to do, I guess, right? That's what everybody does. That's why you probably when you're when you hear the news, and you see the same news kind of everywhere all at the same time, that's because somebody sent out a press release, and everybody decided to report on that press release. And, you know, we have to do that. Um, you know, when there's some big new announcement that's really important, we have to report on it. But what I really enjoy is for us to be different to get scoops. And so a couple of years ago, maybe three, four years ago, I started to take a much more active role in 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 choosing the kinds of stories that we cover on universe today. And we built this content management system, thanks to Chad, who's also our video editor, but also our programmer, where I every day I go through all of the space stories, all of my sources, all of the journals, all of the conferences, all of the sources that I have, and put them into this bucket that the writers can then choose from and the writers, writers are free to choose a story that they want. But the writers can also if they're not feeling like they want to dig up a story, they can go and grab one of the ones that I've suggested. And these are these stories are more challenging, because there is no press release, that they have to do some legwork, they have to read a paper, uh, you know, and then be able to report on that paper, or they have to uh, follow on, you know, I've got a lead, but, but they have to follow on and ask more questions and, and so on, and then turn that into a story and try to pull elements together. 
And it's a much more difficult, but it's a much more rewarding kind of work as a journalist where you're not feeling like you're just rewriting press releases from NASA or ESA or whatever. And so that feels really good. And so like, there's been a bunch. So, so one that just like happened three weeks ago was Hippo, which was the largest structure in the universe. And I saw the paper uh, in a journal and I was like, that's news. Like, that's amazing. And so I tasked it to a writer within a day and we had the news and we were the only people with the news. And then a couple of days later, I saw the people who copy our articles. And so now there was us and then there was like the people who copy our articles. And then three, four days later, it was us, the people who copy our articles and then the people who are reporting on the articles are getting copied from us. So there's like more and more. And then uh, just this week, the Max Planck Institute actually released a press release and then everybody reported on it. And so we had like three weeks of lead time on everybody else. And this has happened a bunch of times now because I'm I'm going straight to the journals. And so I think that that feels really good as a, you know, as a publisher, as a, an editor, as the person who is sort of trying to provide a unique uh, narrative message about, you know, the kinds of things that I'm curious about, the kinds of things that I'm inspired by, those are the kinds of stories that I want on Universe Today. And it wasn't until I really started to communicate that to the writers that it didn't feel like that was actually starting to happen. And I wish that I'd gone back and realized that that was the secret sauce. That's the special sauce is the things that I'm curious about, the kinds of stories that we cover on Space Bites, right, are the kinds of things that you as an audience are interested in. And, you know, like, like I'm really into technology that's just around the corner, the kinds of mysteries that we don't know the answer to. And what is a great solution to try to solve that problem? What's a really clever approach, a, a new mission, a technique, whatever. And so I'm always trying to focus on the stuff that's like right around the corner. I want, I like the bleeding edge, but I don't like the stuff that's too far future that it's just like terraforming Mars, right? Um, or, you know, we'll report on it occasionally or building Dyson spheres or black hole engines or warp drives or using wormholes or any of that kind of stuff, because it all just feels so, um, just so far off into the future and so difficult to kind of wrap your mind around, but, but a incremental improvement to a space mission or a new kind of technology that people can kind of wrap their heads around. That's the stuff that I really appreciate. And I really like. And so I think seeing this resonate really well has sort of given me a lot more energy to do that. And so now I'm, um, you know, I would say the the percentage of the stories that we have on universe today, which are different from other platforms, it has just been increasing and increasing. And I'd say now we're closing in on probably 50%. Like I'd say half the stories that we have on Universe Today, you're not going to see anywhere else or for a couple of weeks anyway. And I'm really lucky because the the writers are like really well credentialed. I mean, we have three, four PhDs, right? A PhD astrophysicist, two, two PhD astrophysicists, PhD astronomer, um, and then people who have been space journalists for decades, you know, uh, Alan Boyle, for example, who covers a lot of our spaceflight stuff, he's been a space journalist for longer than I have, right? Like when I showed up, he was one of my mentors and now he's writing with us, which is amazing. Garden Monk, if weird mutant space bacteria grow on the outside of the ISS, how likely is it that those organisms will end up with us on the ground when the station re-enters the atmosphere? When the International Space Station returns to the Earth, the reason why it's being deorbited into Point Nemo, the farthest point from land, uh, into the spacecraft graveyard is because chunks of it are going to survive the re-entry process that there will be bits and pieces that are going to make it all the way back down to the surface of the earth. And so if that happens, then there are going to be chunks that are going to be large enough, they're going to be protecting nooks and crannies inside of them. And so it's entirely feasible that bacteria will survive the journey of re-entry and and crash into the ocean with the International Space Station. But that said, 
you know, any bacteria that was sent to the International Space Station came from Earth. So it's really just coming home. And maybe it's been out there and maybe there's a slightly new strain that's been evolving in in conditions of weightlessness and high radiation and uh, astronaut, whatever is the sweet, sweet astronaut sweat. But, um, but still, like, it's not really that big of a risk because, you know, we evolved bacteria here and we live with it and, and it's just coming home. The astronauts are coming home. Digger Mike 7, after Mars, what is the next outpost? Ceres might be viable, but which of Jupiter's moons could be possible for placing an outpost? Is Callisto outside the Jupiter radiation regime? Realistically, I don't see humanity living in many places beyond the moon and Mars, like maybe the cloud tops of Venus, but even that sounds like a pretty difficult and complicated place to live. There are asteroids that are relatively close to the Earth, and they have a orbital period around the sun that is very similar to the Earth's orbital period. And so that means that we don't need a lot of delta V to go to those asteroids. And so I can imagine that some future station will be set up on a near Earth asteroid, something that has a very low delta V to reach, you know, there are asteroids with less delta V to get to than the moon, or Mars. And so you can imagine that being actually the easiest place to go. And these could serve as gas stations and waypoints to going to other places in the solar system. But you know, beyond that, we're probably like apart from boots on the ground, apart from us going to stand on Titan to go, we can do this. We are humanity and we are capable of doing these kinds of things. There's probably no human reason to go to those those places. I mean, that's a great reason, like alone to just say, hey, we're standing on Titan, right? Selfie picture. But apart from that, um, you know, it's just it's so far away. It's so hostile that you let the robots do that kind of work. Like, there's real value in us setting up giant rotating space stations in the Earth Moon L4 L5 point, uh, maybe some some places that are a little farther away. But after a while, you just you don't want to be far away from Earth, because that's where all the good stuff is. So uh, but who knows what it's going to look like in a couple hundred years. We've got a longer version of this show with one additional question on Patreon. So go over there and you can watch the whole show ad free and completely for free. All right, those are all the questions that we had today. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who showed up for the live chat. Now, we do this show every Monday live at 5pm sometime in the world. And so if you want to join that it's two hours long, I'm answering all of the questions live, I don't know what the questions are going to be. So definitely go and check that out. There should be a link to the next event here on the channel somewhere. All right, I'm going to show you something else from the shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Luke Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Roebuck, Sean Sargent, SpiderSwap.io, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas L. Skadron, and Vlad Shiblin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, another episode of What's on the Shelf behind me. Um, so this one is something that my wife got me as a birthday present one year, and it's called a mini museum. So I'll hold it up. And unfortunately, it can see my eyes on the other side. So I'll try I'll obscure my eyes. So it will focus on the mini museum. And so what these are is these are tiny little important things, pieces of meteorites, I think there's something from John Lennon's guitar, a uh, piece of the Berlin Wall, a uh, piece of chain mail. And so you get this teeny tiny little museum with lots of really cool stuff. There's a piece of a supercomputer. Um, and I've actually got a couple of these back there. So uh, this is really cool. And you just sort of grab it and you look at it and it comes a little book that you can read. So you know, I'm not selling them. I'm not offering them. I, I don't think you can even buy you know, they they sell out the limited editions. But it's you know, if you're looking sort of like the perfect gift for somebody who likes cool nerdy stuff, check out the uh, mini museums. And this was the 300th. Uh, or this will turn into the 300th question show. So again, thank you, Chad for uh, making 300 episodes of this with me. It's awesome. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. I really enjoy this. And I will see all of you uh, next week.